Please rise in body or spirit for the reading of the gospel. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to vindicate himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. I told Bill Warren that with his filming this week at VBS, he now has some blackmail material for me with my dancing. It's very humbling being a minister and dancing for kids. <sighs> Today's scripture brings us a very familiar parable. It might be your favorite one out of all of them. It might be one that you know by heart. This parable, it includes a favorite Bible verse for many and what they live their life by. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But if we allow ourselves to dwell long enough in this parable, it can start to feel uncomfortable. As Pastor Ann and Pastor Morgan have told us before, these parables are not easy reading. They are confusing. They make us feel uncomfortable. They are like a big literary finger pointing at us and our habits. And they force us to examine not just our thoughts here in this worship space, but our action the rest of the week or lack of action. And this parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, is one that is most at risk for disguising itself as a feel-good story. Debbie Thomas, who blogs at Journey with Jesus, writes this with these well-known parables. She says, quote, I've heard these short stories a zillion times, I believe I know them inside, out, and backwards, and therein lies the great danger. They don't challenge me. I read, I nod, and I walk away, unafflicted and unchanged. I feel a similar affliction with this parable. It's a feel-good story, but if you read this parable without some measure of discomfort, you're reading it wrong. 
So Jesus places his listeners on a familiar path in this story. That road between Jerusalem and Jericho, it was often called the bloody road because of how many violent incidents took place there. And it was common knowledge that it was a risky journey and going by yourself meant you were putting yourself in a precarious position. A little geography for you, Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level and Jericho right by the Dead Sea is 600 feet below sea level. And this drop in height on this road occurs just over a few miles and this leaves plenty of curves and nooks and caves for desperate lawbreakers to become violent and attack someone. And then once they get their valuables, they disappear again behind a curve into the desert. The first century historian Josephus wrote about this road and how they would always bring weapons when they traveled along it. And so we have these three characters the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, who took on a measure of risk in this journey. It's extremely likely that all three of these characters traveled this road with some sort of fear. And so we might imagine that each of these three are not taking their time in their journey. They're probably hurrying along, and it's the priest first who walks by, and he sees this man bloody and beaten, and immediately his body, the priest's body, starts coursing with adrenaline. Why? Because he's wondering if the bad guys are still lingering for their next victim. And he's carrying some valuables for the service that he has to get to, a service he is running late for, and he jogs much faster down the road. And then the Levite comes along, and he too sees this man, and it fills him with fear. And this Levite doesn't have quite the same high status as a priest, but he bears a similar call to take care of others. But he also has a fear of becoming unclean by touching a corpse, compounded by his fear of walking on this bloody road alone, and his fear keeps his feet moving quickly. And the man in the ditch, let us not forget about him. His vision is blurred with blood, and his head is pounding, and his hearing is going in and out. And he can see both of these men go by, and he assumes he is done for. He is in his final hour. But could his need be any more obvious? It makes me think of the quote, people will forget what you did, People will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Maya Angelou. And this man has never felt so low. And then the Samaritan comes along. The man whose heritage is a mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish peoples. Thanks to the splitting of Israel into the northern and the southern kingdoms, and Assyrians invading northern Israel in the eighth century, and then intermarrying with each other. And there was also an incident with Samaritans building a temple in their area of northern Israel because they couldn't get to Jerusalem, but that violated Jewish law and heritage that dictated that the temple be built in Jerusalem. And because of this mixed heritage and these stories, he has been despised and discriminated against his whole life. His ancestors carry this history with Jewish people that still hangs around his neck like a heavy yoke. And he's been the recipient of prejudice and hostility and hatred. And perhaps because of these experiences, he may be slightly less afraid to see the victim of violence. And perhaps he sees this man bloody and beaten and immense compassion swells within him because he can empathize. He knows how it feels to experience hatred from people who don't even know you. He knows how it feels for your humanity to be ignored. Often in preaching class in seminary, they ask you what character speaks the most to you and why. 
The character that sticks out to me the most is not even in the actual story. The character that sticks out to me is the lawyer. It's the lawyer's behavior that reveals the most to me about myself. And this one phrase stood out to me and haunted me all week long, quote, wanting to vindicate himself. Clearly, this lawyer is wrestling with feelings of inadequacy or guilt, wanting to do the right thing, perhaps wondering how little he can do in order to pass the test. He wants to do good, he really does, but deep down he feels overwhelmed and unmotivated to go as far as Jesus is requesting. He is bartering for a lower standard. Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Who exactly do I need to be this extravagant with? What exactly are my parameters here? Because it can't be everybody. That can't be what you're asking me to do. And it made me wonder in my reflection, what are the things that vindicate us from that tall order of Jesus's message? You know, what parts of Jesus's message do we try to barter with for a lower standard? What are the things that make us say, well, that sounds really great, Jesus, but that makes no sense in our world today. It's naive, it's simplistic, you're asking too much of me, I just can't do it. Is there a lower membership tier I can subscribe to? What or who are your vindicators? What are the things that convince you that Jesus' message is just a little too radical for you to live out in your own life and makes you feel better about relaxing those standards? One vindicator that sticks out to me is our distractions. The things that preoccupy our minds and they do not pay rent up there and it's infuriating, our busy schedules, our to-do lists, maybe that one argument that we keep replaying in our head or distracting emotions that we don't want to feel, these are our vindicators. You know, when our minds are so crammed full with things, it is so hard to imagine living out Jesus' message of compassion. And the excuses for not being compassionate come up awfully quickly, don't they? Our lives and minds already feel chock full to the brim, and by asking for compassion to a stranger, when we already feel stretched thin, it feels like pressure on a dam with cracks appearing in the concrete. And we just say, you know what, Jesus? Not today, not this week, not this month, not this year. Please catch me at a better time. But here's a question for you. Do you think it's a coincidence that as the world becomes more accustomed to busy as normal, as the world seems to have jolted awake from a pandemic sleep, as the world buzzes with new technologies that keep our attention spans just a few seconds long, where we're overwhelmed with opportunities and extracurriculars and advertisements, ugh. Do you think it's any coincidence that in the same time that the most vulnerable in our society are neglected once again, or worse, their misery and plight is not believed. Do you think it's any coincidence that the more distracted we are, the more we find an excuse to turn away from others in hardship and pain? Do you find it a coincidence that during the pandemic, when all distractions fell to the wayside, and the only thing pre preoccupying our brain was how to not do anything, to avoid exposure, and it seemed like the world opened its eyes to everyone's needs. You know, food bank donations seemed to surge, and random acts of kindness became passion projects, and we started to finally notice and thank people who keep our world turning and moving, our essential workers, 
people who had been there all along, and we just never noticed them until now. And remember, seeing other people in person became this absolutely delightful rarity instead of a weekly usual activity. And we could feel ourselves enjoying this total reversal of life, but we also had this immense fear that life would never be the same. We missed our distractions. And then, as soon as the threat of the pandemic started to dissipate a little bit, our awareness of others' needs seemed to evaporate. And then we started to see those tremendous economic effects of the pandemic. The number of evictions began to rise, and now there are 140 million poor and low-income people in the United States. 43% of the nation and 52% of children are poor and low-income. And pandemic job losses were centered heavily around those who have low-income jobs. And get this, there is nowhere in the United States where someone with a minimum wage job can afford housing, health care, and food. Nowhere. Meanwhile, U.S. billionaires increased their wealth by 2.1, not million, not billion, but trillion dollars. And in a cruel coincidence, at the same time that we start to be more distracted, that our schedules become more full, that our minds become more stretched, the world's needs just seem to increase exponentially. And here we are. Here is the thing. Distractions make us believe that whatever is on our list, the immediate, the deadline, is the most important work. That your to-do list is the most important thing. And that whatever is occupying the most square feet in your head is the most important thing. Let me give you a real example in my life. When I work in the church office, I am trying to churn through my to-do list. And some days I can only get through a few things on my list. Some days, none at all. And it can make me feel really frustrated and a little useless. And soon, how I start to measure my worth is by what I get done. And somehow I'm always in a rush, whatever I do, and then I come home and I have all these to-dos left unchecked, and oh my gosh, I haven't spent that much time with my daughter today, and I haven't gotten any quality time with my husband, and there are dishes to do, and, 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 and. And my worth continues to dive. It is a miserable place and mindset to live in. When I make my to-do list my biggest priority, then I become so distracted that I don't notice the world, the need around me. And the people around me, they're just distractions from my distractions. That's not how God wants our world to be. Distractions and to-do lists are not the most important thing. The most important work is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. I imagine the priest and the Levite would have stopped to help if they weren't so distracted by their own fear, their own to-do list items, their next meeting, their fear of the ritualistic consequences if they did touch a corpse. And our world sometimes succeeds in convincing us that it is our distractions and our to-do lists that save us. But in actuality, friends, they are killing us. They blind us to other people. And they put productivity above community, and they value independence over dependence. And when we make our to-do lists and our distractions a higher priority than the needs of the world, evil is dressing itself in garments of good. You know, we are like the priest or the Levite walking by, afraid for our own life, afraid of breaking social rules or running late for the next thing. And instead of allowing ourselves to stop and feel compassion and step into this person's pain for just a minute, 
we find some way to distance ourselves from it. And once we choose distractions as the most important thing, we will do almost anything to avoid stepping into the world's pain. The life of being distracted is poisonous and it's unsustainable. It separates us from each other. It puts us on this hamster wheel where no matter what we get done, we never feel truly accomplished. It puts us in a place where we feel like we are always rushing to the next thing. And it puts us on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, ignoring a blatant need that we are able to meet. So what do we do? You say, Pastor Alice, you have put me in a very depressed place. I need to go lie down. We have to shift from that distraction mindset to a holy intervention mentality. What is that exactly? I am so glad you asked. It's the mindset of welcoming the unexpected. It's the mindset of knowing that at any moment, God can gently tap you on the shoulder or put a little tug on your heart that, hey, there is an opportunity to show compassion and God's great love here. And it's the idea that the unplanned, <gasps> oh, that's my worst nightmare, is the ripe soil to plant the love of God in others. That any moment God could speak to us and show us an opportunity to show love. And it's the idea that God can free us from our distraction hamster wheel if we choose to stop and notice our surroundings. And it's the mindset that shakes us out of our individualistic thinking and places us in the context of our neighbors. You know, the lawyer in our story, he asks, who is my neighbor, and centers the question around himself, who is a neighbor to me, when really he should be asking, who am I a neighbor to? Who am I treating with care and compassion? And this holy intervention mentality, it brings in the belief that your neighbor is every person that crosses your path today. And it means that every moment and every minute, you may have an opportunity to be compassionate. And it also means that the world's pain is not so intimidating or scary anymore because God has all of us out here in the world displaying compassion to others. It doesn't mean having a completely open schedule. It doesn't mean you still have to get out of printing the order of worship, David and Alice. But it means keeping your heart and your mind open for things to shift. You know, on those days in the office when I don't get through any of my list, I can choose to see these interruptions as annoying distractions or holy interventions depending on the day, let's be honest. I am busy helping the needs of those people around me, things I did not plan for, but it's God's work. And these holy interventions mean that your worth is not tied up in what you accomplish or the number, number of things you can juggle in your head, but rather your identity is tied up in a calling to be a neighbor with compassion towards those you meet. And your worth, each one of you as God's creation is innate, not dependent on how much you check off that list. And it's the idea that you can be shaken out of your narrow tunnel vision of your distractions in order to see the much broader, much wider, much more wonderful world that God created. And it's the mindset that cultivates hope. Instead of seeing all that still needs to happen, we can see how much God has done in us and through us. And when we dwell with those holy interventions, we can start to see how often God is working in the world. We can start to witness God's compassion and love in others and in ourselves. And when we realize we are a part of God's action through compassion, 
We can start to live with hope that the world can be changed, one loving action at a time. And finally, it's the mindset that vindicates us from our vindicators. You know, you don't have to live at the whim of your distractions. Your days do not have to be defined by them. And you don't have to listen to its lies about your worth and your productivity. And you don't have to barter with Jesus for a lower standard of gospel work. The holy doesn't just intervene to save a person in need. It also intervenes to save you, to remind you to show compassion to yourself, to not let your distractions leave you weak or bruised or bloody, to show you a more sustainable, more loving, more present way to live, to show you how vital you are and important in doing God's work. As Jesus said, go and do likewise. Amen. We end our service.